start with talking about the League of Nations. The League of Nations is established at the end of World War I uh, during the Treaty of Versailles. It's one of the ideas that Woodrow Wilson, who was the President of the United States of America, brought to the table. And he basically said, look, I want to prevent further wars. I want people to be able to talk it out. Now, this is the first of many things that you might be like, oh, that's totally naive and so retro. But you got to figure the World War, the World War One, the World War One was the most devastating war that had ever happened up to that point. So the idea of maybe preventing it and never having another terrible war again, that was very appealing to a lot of people. And so if you said, let's have a big club and every nation sends a representative and talks it out, that's going to appeal to a lot of people at the time period who lost their sons, their fathers, their husbands. It was an awful time. Problem. The League of Nations was a little bit too much like a club where people sit around and talk because it didn't have much behind it. For example, uh, if you, for example, invade someone, like Ethiopia is going to be invaded by Mussolini, um, what is the League of Nations going to do about that? Well, they can recommend stop, but they don't have any, like, BAM! We're going to make you stop, son! They don't have any of that. It's very much a, hey, you really, please stop, or we will send you a strongly worded letter. And that just doesn't work with bullies. Trust me. High school taught me that. So, when you look at this map, I want you to be aware, every nation that has a color was a member of the League of Nations. Is there any nations that aren't? Oh, what about this one right here? Oh, yes, America. But, Mr. Oliver, was it the League of Nations the idea of um, Woodrow Wilson? Yeah, it was. So, why wouldn't America be part of it? That's kind of an American history question, but long story short, the League of Nations was the brainchild of Democratic President Woodrow Wilson. The job to ratify treaties in the United States of America is the Senate. So, perhaps that might have been the problem, you think. Uh, yeah, it actually was. The Senate Republicans were angry with Wilson. Uh, they didn't like their amount of representation they received on being invited over. Uh, to the Treaty of Versailles in that they really weren't. And also they didn't want to be entangled in foreign deals. Remember Woodrow Wilson had run for president on the idea he would not get our boys involved in foreign wars. So maybe it was kind of hypocritical of him to be like, oh yeah, now I want to become like Mr. International. So we never ratified that treaty. We made a separate treaty with Germany. We're not still at war with them. And um, the United States never joins the League of Nations. And this political car uh, political uh, cartoon basically says, yo, America, you guys, it was designed by the president. You guys should be the keystone, the middle, the thing that brings us all together. But America's just sitting around like, woo! -hoo! Don't smoke, kids. Look how unhappy he looks. Anyway, meanwhile, countries are making agreements to prevent further wars. How do we prevent further wars? We sign a treaty, obviously, where we promise not to. Now, again, this is going to be another time where you're like, Mr. Oliver, that sounds ridiculous. No one is going to actually follow that. The problem is a lot of people followed that, except for the ones you had to worry about, which really isn't that always the way. Like you tell people, you know, don't take my stuff. You don't need to be telling most people that. You need to be telling, like, Mr. I want to take your stuff. I don't know why he sounded like Batman. Anyway, a good example of that is Locarno Agreement. Uh, sometimes you'll hear things referred to as the spirit of Locarno. Uh, and the idea of that and things like the kellogg briand Pact are that they want to prevent war from ever being used as an instrument of foreign policy. That... Okay, look, I'm going to be honest with you about this. The most important thing about this picture is Hitler 
playing football because he looks ridiculous. And I'm always in favor of Hitler looking ridiculous. See, there's the League of Nations is having a game. There's an international scrum, like a pile up. Everybody's like, bah, 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 bah. Here, oh, look, peace is in our grasp. And Hitler's like, no. And Franco's in the back. Franco, of course, uh, is the uh, Spanish Civil War guy. I think, did I already talk about it? I don't know. We might. Anyway, if you watched my lecture about Mussolini, you know that he invades Ethiopia in 1935 to avenge a loss at Ethiopia's hands, which is embarrassing for him because Ethiopia is not really known as a powerhouse in 1935, of course. Nowadays, everybody thinks of them that way. Spoilers, no, they don't. Uh, but they were not really a powerhouse, and Italy had like a big self-esteem thing. They were like, oh yeah, we're a new country, we're going to get in there, and we're going to imperialize and be racist, and all, and then they lose. Which is good for people who don't like racism, yay, but bad for Italian pride. So Mussolini says, we're going to go in there, and we're going to lay some smack down on Ethiopia. At the time, Ethiopia wasn't called Ethiopia, by the way, it was called Abyssinia, but it's Ethiopia nowadays. If you want to confuse things, that's cool. Whatever. Anyway, he rolls in there with his air force and his machine guns, and they're taking on the Ethiopian army, which really hasn't been focusing on defense against a European nation. Uh, they have one plane in their air force, and it is a mail plane. Not like a boy plane. I mean like it delivers mail. Uh, so really, they're not up for this. So it is a disaster for Ethiopia. They get conquered. The leader of Ethiopia, a guy named Haile Selassie, goes to the League of Nations, asks them, what are you going to do about this? The League of Nations says, Mussolini, yo, not cool, bro. Mussolini leaves. So he's no longer part of the League of Nations. Italy isn't. Oh, did that solve the problem? No, because Italy still took over uh, Ethiopia. Meanwhile, <clears throat> Japan, can I edit? This? Meanwhile, Japan is talking about how they want to get rid of European influences in Asia. Now, this is not a crazy goal. This is actually a fairly reasonable nationalist kind of thing. The thing is, what they also wanted was their own empire, but they're saying they want Asia for the Asians. See, what they want is a greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere where all the Europeans are kicked out. What in reality happens is they begin to expand their island empire over to the mainland, which is China, starting with Manchuria in 1931 and then mainland China in 1937. And they are, are brutal when they do it. Initially, the Chinese army holds them off a little bit. Uh, the Japanese are still advancing, but they're not as advancing as quickly as they thought they would. So by the time they get to Nanking, they're ready to go. And the problem is that the city of Nanking has 90,000 Chinese soldiers that surrender. The Japanese, they have this warrior code, Bushido it's called. And it says, you don't surrender. If you're a man, you do not surrender. What kind of person does that? So what the Japanese do at this point is get into Nanking and they are ordered by their leader, who is the uncle of the emperor, to kill everything, everyone, destroy everything. Uh, terrible things are permitted. Rapes uh, happen to approximately 80% of the population which at that time is 500,000 people who have not left the city, and that includes 90,000 troops. They use men uh, and women alike as live bayonet practice. They hold beheading contests. Uh, babies are stripped from uh, mother's wombs. Um, little girls are raped. I mean, this is awful, terrible stuff. And if you're wondering why you haven't heard of it, that's a good question. Because, as you can see in front of you, there are films and, like, literally films, movie films, and um, photos of this. The Japanese actually went to the Chinese and asked them to develop photos. Can you believe that? And 
then the Chinese people, the photo developers, made copies. They were outraged, obviously, made copies, and some of those were smuggled out. Some people within the city who were international observers, uh, people like uh, John McGee, who was an American missionary, uh, even a Nazi named uh, John Raba, uh, he, or Rabe, if you want to be American about it. Uh, he uh, he actually even smuggled film that McGee had taken with a camera. I don't know why that's a camera, but it was. And um, sent it to Hitler, who reportedly viewed it and then forbade it to ever be seen again. Uh, so um, this is awful, terrible stuff. It's one of the worst things in history. Uh, sadly, this is not the only atrocity that the Japanese army commits during World War II. Um, I think that the the leaders of the Japanese thought that they would be toughening up their soldiers by having them kill indiscriminately and toughen them up as men. Uh, it's a terrible thing that happened. Um, there's nothing else to say about it. Meanwhile, back in Europe, uh, Hitler proclaims Germans as the master race. Um, this you, you may recall my talk about that where I talked about how Aryans were this uh, European master race that Hitler saw himself as the ancestor of. Uh, these are the you know blonde-haired, blue-eyed knights from the Middle Ages, um, and then before that, the Vikings. And he wanted to clear out Eastern Europe for of this master race, and the word for that is Lebensraum, living space. Going to Hitler's own work here, uh, his work Mein Kampf, he says, the future goal of our foreign policy must be the acquisition of the necessary soil for our German people. Since we need strength for this, but the mortal enemy of our nation, France, relentlessly throttles us and robs our strength, we must take, undertake every sacrifice which may help bring about a nullification of the French drive for European hegemony. Every power which, like us, finds intolerable France's aspiration to dominion over the continent is today our natural ally. Mr. Albert, I don't, I don't get it. There's lots of words there I do not understand. Basically saying, number one, we got to take over stuff in the east. Number two, France is going to try to stop us. We must make friends with anyone who hates France. We must remember that France is our mortal enemy. That's words right from there. Mortal enemy. And eventually, we've got to take them down. Now, so that sounds like two different things, right? You've got Lebensraum, and then you've got the idea that France needs to be taken out. But really, they're kind of hand in hand. Because his goal is to move into the east, clear out the Untermenschen. Uh, to him, that would be not only the Jews, but also the Slavic people, um, the Roma, commonly referred to as gypsies, which is a kind of offensive term. Don't be saying that all the time. Say Roma instead. And uh, anyone else he finds undesirable. And then he can move all the Aryans in there. He feels like Germany is massively overcrowded. Meanwhile oppose France, because France is going to try to stop them from doing that, and then eventually destroy France. So, uh, in order to accomplish that, he makes friends of those who do not want the French to be dominating them. And that would be the other bullies of the world at the time. Uh, Mussolini, pictured here. So, he basically, he, he makes friends with all the other bullies in Europe, which include Japan and Italy. So, they formed the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo Axis, which will give us a convenient nickname for the bad guys in World War II. And they are the bad guys. Make no mistake about it. And he will immediately begin breaking the Treaty of Versailles. If you read Mein Kampf, which I do not recommend because it's really terrible, but if you do, you will see over and over again a theme is that he hates the Treaty of Versailles. First thing... Start breaking it. Rearm Germany. If you might recall, when I talked about this earlier, Hitler had his own private army of brown shirts, the SA, which was actually form formed by Ernst Röhm, which by 1934 or so, numbered 2.5 million people. Uh, 
he folds those guys into the Wehrmacht, the, the German army, and makes compulsory, compulsory military service, uh, mandatory military service for all men. He also begins to rebuild the air force, uh, rebuilds uh, Germany's tank force, uh, leading to uh, Germany having panzers. Uh, Beck, that's their big tank they're known for in World War II. And goes into the, the Rhineland, which is the land right on the west side of, Germ west side of Germany. Um, it's right there with, uh, with France. And no one does anything. A lot of people are sympathetic to him. They say, hey, you know, we were kind of harsh on Germany. It's 20 years have passed, roughly. You know, maybe we should let them have these things. Oh, so Hitler's emboldened. So he says, oh, okay, well, um, I'm going to take over Austria. What do you think about that? That's also forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles, by the way, making an alliance between Germany and Austria. But Hitler just does it. Oh, that lady looks so sad, you say. No, she is not sad. That woman is crying tears of joy as she's hiding as German troops are walking through the street. And as the Germans enter Austria, they're greeted as heroes, not just by this lady, but by many people. Because Hitler is essentially a hometown boy. Remember, he was born in Linz, Austria in 1889. He's coming home. He's bringing all these ideas of Germans being dominant and superior, the Germans retaking that which has been lost, and maybe restoring a little German pride. And for a lot of these people, especially Austria, which had suffered so greatly territorial-wise after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, this is seen as a very positive thing. Does anyone else do anything about this? No, nothing. Then Hitler decides he wants to annex the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland is this area right here. Uh, it's this kind of mustardy poop color. Um, not in real life. But it represents where these German people were located after World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. Remember, Czechoslovakia didn't exist prior to World War I. It had been part of Austria as Bohemia for quite a while. Uh, which was part of the Austria, Austria-Hungarian Empire, the second, the, the first Reich, first Reich, and um, and so Hitler says, "Yo, I want to be annexing that stuff. Those German people are being treated badly." And Czechoslovakia is like, "No, no, they're not. Hitler, you are totes lying," and, he, and he's like, "No, I'm not lying." So, the Prime Minister of England, Britain, Neville Chamberlain, flies over to Munich to meet Hitler, and he arranges the Munich Pact, which essentially says, hey Hitler, if you want the Sudetenland, it's yours, bro. But, in exchange, you've got to promise no more invading stuff. And Hitler's like, me? Invade more things? I would never do that. You don't think you can trust me? And Chamberlain is so excited about this that he goes home and he's like, bros, I have achieved peace in our time. We're going to prevent another world war. Of course, Chamberlain is wrong. And history has not been kind to him uh, because he's seen as this naive figure that went along with Hitler's uh, beliefs even when uh, Hitler had already proven himself to be a little dodgy um, internationally and very dodgy racially in his own country. But if you look at it from the perspective of they're trying to prevent another major world war, you can see Chamberlain's perspective a little easier. And he thought, you know what, even if these guys are totalitarians, even if they are these hardcore, we are, you know, we're so bad, we're so nationalist, we can still reason with them because ultimately they want what's best for Europe and their own children. Wrong! Hitler is a psychopath, but he got duped. 
So uh, Chamberlain is going to lose power shortly after this to be replaced by one of my favorites in history, Winston Churchill. So here is Europe after Hitler has taken the Sudetenland. Notice now it has also become green now. Germany's looking pretty big. They've taken over Austria. Hitler promised not to take anything else. I'm sure we can totes trust him, right? No, we totally cannot trust Hitler. The moral of the story is, don't trust racist psychopaths. They will betray you. People will use you as an example of someone who is too trusting and soft on dictators. Uh, Chamberlain is evoked all over the place. Now that you know about it, pay attention to the news. Anytime there's a dictator type, somebody who's a strong man type, and they are all, oh, we're going to take over this, or we're going to do this, you will see a massive backlash against anybody who tries to negotiate with that guy because they don't want to be Chamberlain Part 2. It happened with Iraq and Saddam Hussein. It's happened with t right now as I'm recording this. I don't know when you're watching it. You might be watching it in the future. But right now it's happening with the Crimea and Vladimir Putin. And it is bonkers. So, careful. Here's a political cartoon by a guy named David Lowe. He's an American. Uh, he shows Hitler literally thumbing his nose at the spineless leaders of democracy. And this is very offensive to thumb your nose at someone. It's probably not to you, but think of like Hamlet. Uh, well, that wouldn't be, even be Hamlet. You might be familiar with Romeo and Juliet, the I bite my thumb at you kind of thing. It's, this is offensive. Don't do this to your great-grandparents because they will be very offended. Anyway, he's walking all over them. Literally, there's a double entendre here. He is not only walking over them, he is walking over them, metaphorically, doing whatever he wants while they are so spineless. Oh, well, someone's got to stop him, right? Well, so far, Hitler's doing a pretty successful job. He sees himself as not firing a single shot and doubling the size of Germany restoring it to its former greatness. Meanwhile, he's virtually eradicated unemployment. And for the average German, they're willing to overlook. You know, hey, yeah, he's pretty racist, but, you know, it's cool. A lot of people were very racist at the time. I mean, I've talked about it in my other lectures, but the official position of the Catholics and the Lutherans at the time, and I'm not saying this is the way it is now, was that Jews should not be killed, but if you make them suffer a little bit, that's okay. And Hitler saw himself as doing the work of God. Now, time out. Am I saying he really was? Absolutely not. This guy's a bad word, bad word person. But um, is it fair to say that Hitler thought he was genuinely doing a good thing? Yes, he's wrong, but maybe he thought that. Is it fair to think maybe a lot of good people otherwise were willing to overlook these racist things because they weren't that concerned about the Jews? Absolutely, I think it's fair. Do I think they should have done that? Of course not. But that's what they do. Now, if you're looking at this map, over here, you got Germany, 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 Poland, Germany. Wait a second. You straight up put Poland right through my Germany. What's that all about? Well, that's called the Polish Corridor. Uh, you're guaranteeing uh, Polish access to the sea. So, Hitler's next target is going to be Poland. But there's another big country over here on the right side of the screen. And that, of course, is the Soviet Union. So, Hitler decides he's going to make a treaty with the Soviets. And this treaty is not going to be a treaty like World War I style, where... Okay, if I get attacked, you got my back. If you get attacked, I got your back. It's not like that. It's a non-aggression treaty. Straight up, I'm going to leave you alone if you leave me alone. Cool? Bros. And that's what takes place in 1939 between Hitler and Stalin. Now, pause for a second. What did Hitler write about Russia in his book Mein Kampf? Well, he said... You see me formatting as I do this. I messed up when I cut and pasted it. 
Uh, he says, we must never forget that the regents of present-day Russia are common blood-stained criminals, that here is the scum of humanity, which, favored by conditions in a tragic hour, overran a great state, he's referring to Nicholas II's empire, the Romanov Empire, butchered and rooted out millions of its leading intellects with savage bloodthirstiness, and for nearly ten years has exercised the most frightful regime of tyranny of all time. Nor must we forget that these rulers belong to a nation which combines a rare mixture of bestial horror with an inconceivable gift of lying, and today more than ever believes itself called upon to impose its bloody oppression upon the whole world. Now you tell me, does that sound like somebody who is like, you know what, I'm totally cool with these Soviet guys? Absolutely not. Uh, Hitler hates the communists. He also ties it in with race, which makes very little sense. He's going off of the fact, he's like, well, Karl Marx came up with communism, and Karl Marx was Jewish, therefore all communism is Jewish. It makes no sense. It's crazy, racist person, idiot talk. But a lot of conservatives are threatened by Bolshevism, by communism. A lot of of people in Germany are concerned for their safety so he's like you know what it's pretty easy to convince people that the Soviets are our enemies so it's pretty shocking to the world when the Hitler and the Stalin are all of a sudden BFFs because they hate each other and Hitler has been teaching everybody to hate the communists since he was running for office since before that since he was jumping up on beer hall tables I mean, he has been anti-communist forever. So, they make a secret agreement to divide Poland. And this, of course, is a funny political cartoon. You've got uh, Hitler on the left and Stalin on the right. Uh, their little cake has both of their symbols. And uh, I wonder how long the honeymoon will last is what it says at the bottom. Clearly, people were cynical about this partnership lasting for long. Uh, but there it is. Um, Hitler, actually Hitler did not technically ever meet Stalin. Uh, Hitler sent his uh, diplomat, uh, Ribbentrop, who I believe is this guy right here. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Um, and uh, he uh, signed it by proxy there. And one of the most famous political cartoons, again by a guy named David Lowe, is this one right here. It's called Rendezvous. And it says, the scum of the earth, I believe. That's Hitler on the left. Uh, he's actually quoting himself from Mein Kampf, which I just read a second ago to you. And then on the right, Stalin, quoting himself, the bloody assassin of the workers, I presume. And they're both politely greeting each other, but it's kind of like a frenemies kind of thing. It's like a mean girls kind of thing, where they both hate each other, but they're like, mm, you know, let's pretend to be nice, but mm, I don't feel nice with you, bro. And that is um, them standing over the body of Poland. Uh, notice Stalin is on the right or the east, and Hitler is on the left or the west, because that was the secret agreement. Hitler is going to invade Poland, take them out, and then pull back and let Stalin have the east side. East side? I'm going to stop there, because right next to this is when World War II is going to start. So, let's do this.